Welcome in, welcome in. I hope you enjoyed that eclipse. I hope you looked at it with those stupid glasses and you're not blind. I'm David Cooper and this is, this is going well, I think, with David Cooper. The show where no one's listening, no one cares. The show where every episode's the last episode. Today, it's interview extravaganza. I've got not one, not two, not three, not four, not six, but five guests on the show today. Coming up in about 10 minutes is an etiquette expert who I'm going to ask, are Gen Z's having difficulty adjusting to -to back-to-office vibes? They never worked in a professional setting before the pandemic. Then it's my friend, comedy food writer Dennis Lee, who's going to tell us how he mixed the delicious Australian snack Tam Tams chocolate cookies with clam juice. Why, Dennis? Then it's AI tech stories with our tech expert Gabe's Night with Tony Five. And finally, Therapy Thursdays on a Tuesday. Got an action-packed show for you, and I'm glad you chose to listen to it. So let's skip the stories of the day. And I'll ask ourselves, did we enjoy the finale of Curb Your Enthusiasm? Because I know I did. And jump right into our first interview with that etiquette expert that I just mentioned. Stick around. Welcome back. I'm David Cooper. By now, we're back in the office with some corporations forcing employees to go back to the office and not letting them work remote. Sounds fine. But how are people faring? Especially Gen Z's, or as we call them in Canada, Gen Z's. I have with me Micah Meyer, an American-British entrepreneur, but more importantly, etiquette coach. She's the founder of Beaumont Etiquette and co-founder of the Plaza Hotel's finishing program, or as we say in Canada, the Plaza Hotel. Micah, welcome to the show, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to chat all things etiquette. Yes, I read last November that Amazon employees said they felt there was less of a chance of being promoted if they worked from home. Then yesterday I saw a report that Dell, the computer company, they just went out and said it. They said, fine, you can stay remote, but if you don't come back to the office, you're not getting a promotion, which is wild to me, having been formerly worked in tech. Um, But we've been home, some of us, since what, 2020, early 2020? Years, literally years now. Um, So yeah, 2020, it was like March 2020. And those who were functional employees in the office may have forgotten how to do it. And then, of course, there's newly graduated workers who've spent their whole professional lives in this weird work from zone, work from home twilight zone. Do you think there's people that forget how to behave like normal human beings in the office when they haven't been in there in a while? (laughs) I do. I completely do. And I think it is it's not really their fault. I always say it's not their fault. But I think there's kind of two there's two groups here. There's one that never really learned the workforce outside of working virtually. And there's the other side that sort of just forgot. They just forgot the niceties of working with other people. And that could be multi-generational, right? But it's all of the same at the same time, all of these generations, these two groups merging into one situation. And of course, it's caused mass pandemonium amongst many businesses. And so you've created a career out of helping people figure out how to relate to other people in public. Exactly, exactly. And it sounds so basic. It really, really does. But at the end of the day, sometimes we come in and we can say things that companies and HR teams can't uh, because we're external. So we kind of just say how it is. We're kind of like your your big brother, sister, corporate friends who have all the intel from the HR side that will teach you how to get ahead in your careers uh, from what we know about working with that company. So we're, we, we always like to say, we're on your side. We're, we're with you. So what are some mistakes we're seeing in the office that we didn't used to see prior to the, the thing that happened in early 2020? that thing. Uh, Well, I would say, you know, it's everything from people being too casual on email. I I showed up to this taping with a full beard. I'm like, I should have shaved because you're so put (laughs) together. I look disheveled, but go on, please. No, 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 please. You know, it's one of those things that I think right now there's a statistic that just came out that people within within the first three minutes of receiving a text message, 95 percent of people read them and often reply, but we do it so rapidly and business is done. The majority of business is now done virtually, whether that be on email or text message. So it's the little things like not writing T Y and spelling it out. Thank you. Because that shows professionalism. It is, 
you know, uh, it is remembering how to network. I think Gen, I mean, Gen Z, really, it's not, it's not their fault. I always say it's, it's really not. They grew up speaking and communicating, you know, via electronic devices. And now we thrust them into this world where they're expected to network and know what to do. And they have anxiety. They tell me, I have anxiety about this. I'd rather email than pick up the phone or show up to an event. So I teach them those soft skills. And my team and I, we go in and we literally teach them how to network, how to make eye contact, how to introduce themselves, how to introduce other people, what to say when you have nothing to talk about with somebody else. And we just teach them those little tricks like tips and and techniques to make them feel confident. Well, that's my whole career, what to say when I have nothing to talk about. But the art of the schmooze, I feel like that is a lost art with younger people. They're just texting, they're just TikToking, they're doing all this. But in that office place, like who to be friends with? How to, how to be soft, how to not come off as desperate, how to get the leaders to notice you, all those things that can get you ahead in the office that unfortunately, for better or worse, have nothing to do with your actual capability in the office um, are the things that can get you ahead sometimes. So how do we do it? How do we schmooze? You know, what the best thing about schmoozing, I love the question, how do we schmooze? I think is to figure out what the person you're talking to wants. What do they need or want? And you have to play that role. So if you can become a social chameleon professionally or socially, then you will be able to schmooze. So for example, if I'm talking to a client and I know they're looking for just that professional person in that moment, then I play that professional role. If I'm talking to a colleague who needs support, then I'm saying, so what can I do for you? How can I help you? So it's figuring out what a person needs and delivering that in whatever way you can. Conversation, help, assistance, an offer. That's how you schmooze. It feels so icky reducing it to that, though. Like thinking, okay, all my social interactions are I'm sneakily finding out what they need, and then I'm going to help them with it. It's a, it, Actually, the end result is you being a good person, but you're doing it for like <laughs> sneaky reasons. And I think that's why people are so bad at it. Well, if if you're doing it for self-serving purposes, I would say it's sneaky, but you're actually helping. You are being a good person. I think the key is not doing it to, to, to have something given back to you in return. Doing it to give just to give and not to say, what will that give me in return is I think the difference. Because if you're just schmooze, a schmooze, schmooze, that's a hard word. The schmooze has a negative connotation, but the best schmoozers are the best networkers. The best networkers are those who figure out what somebody needs and then they deliver that through a feel good moment in whatever capacity that is. See, I'm not sure I agree. I think it's okay to have some self-serving motivation if the end result is great. Like if I gave a billion dollars to a charity, but I wanted my name on the building or I wanted that (laughs) interview, I wanted the positive press, David gave a a billion dollars to charity. I'm still helping, (laughs) but I'm also being self-serving because I'm getting myself some really good PR here. But the net result is good. So I think we can take that lesson to the office place. Like, oh yes, I want the boss to like me and then I might get promoted. But yes, I'm also helping deliver, you know, good quality work, which is what the boss needs. Okay, that's fair. I I changed. I changed my mind. You're right. You can be a little self-serving in that way. If you say it like that, you're right. Wow. I'm just imagining how I used to argue with my ex-wife and it did not go that way. Not important. (laughs) But did you notice, hold on, (laughs) just stepping back. Did you notice I gave you what you were looking for in that moment? (laughs) Touche, touche, my friend. Uh. My insecure quest to be right uh, was satisfied. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, I'm glad you came here, Micah. Okay, Gen Zs. They are just out of university, just out of college, or just graduated high school. They spent the last four years, like very formative years, very formative for how to have proper social skills in a quote unquote adult world. They spent it yeah. locked up. They spent it inside. They spent it doing remote learning. Zoom calls, texting, not to mention the launch of uh, new social media platforms and shareable video platforms that are lowering the attention span of anyone who uses them. Uh, I I don't want to be too hard on the Gen Zs about TikTok or whatever. Uh, Congress is already doing that. But what do you say to them who don't have that? Like for me, I worked in a professional setting for 10 years before the pandemic, actually more, 12. Gen Zs never did that. They, They don't like have the foundation. So what skills are they maybe lacking and what advice would you give to them to try to, to make up for it so they can fit in with people who've been in professional settings before? 
The yes, yeah, so the and when I go into these teams, I actually tell the older generations be a little bit more compassionate to Gen Z because they didn't have it easy at first, um, and they are used to having a moment to think before they reply because it comes through in a text or an email. They think about it and then they reply. So when you're in front of them and they just verbally say whatever they think, sometimes it's because they just don't have the practice. So to be gentle with them in that way, they're also the most brilliant, brilliant generation. They're so smart. Um, So we have to be a bit patient with them because they have a lot to give. Now, that being said, for them. That used to be my generation as a a millennial. Mine too. I'm a millennial. We produced, I don't know, not that I hate Mark Zuckerberg, but we had all these smart young tech people who were billionaires and now we're just old idiots. I know. But, you know, I think we have to we have to just embrace them because they they can they can offer and they will offer a lot in the workplace. Now, what I would say to them is that you you as a generation, Gen Z as a generation here, um, you know, you don't have the inter the interaction face to face. And that's not your fault. So you have to go out. You can't just say, well, I never had that. I had a rough start with COVID. It doesn't matter. It, you have to take it upon yourself to practice. That means go to Subway Sandwiches and face to face, talk to people. I know that sounds it's that a sounds weird so, example, my, <laughs> Micah, it Subway is because, Sandwiches. Because any, anybody can do it. I grew up with Subway Sandwiches and that's it. So it's like, if you feel uncomfortable talking to somebody, start a conversation with anybody who you will come across in your day. Um, if it is at the library, is it when you're studying, is it whoever, it, it doesn't matter, but you need to jump in there and start having face-to-face interactions with people, start conversations, try to keep, make it a game, try to keep conversations going on dates at, networking events at parties whatever you have ex- access to whether it's subway sandwiches or a uh, black tie gala whatever your world is take advantage of these tiny moments where you're speaking with people because that is where the workforce is saying gen z is lacking but it's easy to fix and they can do it because they're so smart good i agree they're so smart it's just we used that used to be our generation i guess it's a morning mm-hmm. of you know, the passing of of the ages but yeah, no, it's, it's funny, no matter what I reduce, whether it's someone who's a great artist, whether it's someone who's a great, you know, engineer, when you reduce it down, it's all just time behind the wheel. And it's so funny to me, this comes up in so many different ways. The way to get better at something is by doing it and doing it and doing it. And there's no secret. And um, yeah, well, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having us. You are quite a fabulous and fun uh, interviewer. So I appreciate you inviting me on. If only I had shaved before the interview, that would have really been better. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to shave after this because I'm going to I'm going to something to network on Friday and I'm like, I look like. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about Beaumont etiquette and, and where I can find out how to be trained by you, because now, quite frankly, I'm interested. Okay, amazing. So we do, we're located in New York City. So right, we're neighbors and uh, we have a training facility right on Central Park South. And so you can come to us. We also do virtual training. We also can come to your company. So tell your companies, hey, we, they do leadership training, they do offsites, they do fun trainings, they do lunch trainings, lunch and learns, all sorts of uh, team kind of organization. Uh, and we can come to you. So we also do virtual lessons one-to-one, or you can take a pre-recorded course on a many, on many, many different um, topics, a plethora of topics, and it's all on beaumontetiquette.com. Fantastic. Micah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Up next, it's Dennis Lee, food and comedy writer who makes horrible food combinations and writes to tell the tale, lives to tell the tale. We'll find out what fishy combination he made with a famous Australian chocolate treat in a moment. Okay, we've got food and comedy writer Dennis Lee here to talk about what unholy food combinations he's been up to. And spoiler, I think the one he's going to tell us about involves a fish brine with chocolate snacks. But Dennis has a lot more to share, so let's jump right in. Dennis, thank you for being here. It's great to talk to you. I'm really excited to talk to you because you recently had the cover story on a well-known food magazine called Appetit Bon, probably. I don't know. That's got to be pretty (laughs) exciting to see your story on the cover of a magazine. Yeah, I've never had a cover story for a magazine before and seeing What about Aunt Millie's family newsletter, Dennis? You must have wrote for that as a kid. All right, well, for for that newsletter, all right. But, you know, this one one had, like, cool 
color photos of, of food and stuff. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is the first time I've ever had a cover story and nobody told me it was coming. So getting to see um, something I wrote as the cover story about Chicago style hot dogs in Chicago, uh, just show up on my doorstep one day without anybody telling me was one of the most incredible feelings ever. Did you realize it was you or did you take a look at it and you're like, who's this jerk who had a hot dog story on the magazine I just wrote for? Well, when I, when I got the preview edition, I opened it up and I, I saw a hot dog on the front thinking, well, oh, that's cool. I like hot dogs. <laughs> and then I look closer at it and I'm like, wait a second. I wrote about this very hot dog. And then it occurred to me that what I had written had ended up being the cover piece for the for March's edition of Bon Appetit. So um, Chicago had a field day with it. Uh, I was getting messages from friends and family left and right. People I didn't know um, were starting arguments with other people they didn't know about the hot dogs I had picked as my favorite in Chicago. Oh, that's got to be the great joy when you write an article and then people on the Internet start arguing about it. Yeah, or or calling me an idiot, because um, that's that's one of those things that happens. But at least you know it stirred up enough emotion where people are starting to fight with each other and call me names and threaten threaten that um, or suggest that I had been bought out by these mom and pop hot dog stands that don't have any money, <laughs> which is like one of the funniest things. You could big hot dog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. the big hot dog lobby is getting you to write about a hot dog truck. You would think it would be like Oscar Mayer or Kraft. Nathan's Heinz, Nathan in New yeah, York. Or yeah, or Nathan's or like, you know. But no, they would think it, they, somebody thought it was like, you know, at some point somebody mentioned something um, a long time ago about something like that, about how mo- uh, it was like mom and pop shops were paying me off. And I'm like, these have you ever seen an owner of a hot dog stand? They're not rolling up in like a, a Maserati. Like they're driving, they're driving up in the greasiest car you've ever seen. You know, like I should eat those uh, top hot dogs and do a mirror review. How bad the stomach ache I get from them for each one is. That could be the sort of like the IBS uh, response to your article. I mean, I have not eaten a hot dog, um, like regularly since I wrote that piece. (laughs) (laughs) I love them, but you know, at some point you're like, all right, I've had too much of a good thing. So. All right. So real food writing is your job, but I think your real passion, whether it's true or not, what I imagine your real passion is comedy food writing. Your uh, sub stack is called food is stupid. And I read about something you did recently that I just loved because it involves Tim Tams, which are Australians uh, national fruit. I'm kidding. They're their national cookie. For those who don't know what they are, they're these wonderful like chocolate covered wafers. But Australians have this tradition of not just eating these cookies, but either dipping them in hot milk, hot tea, sort of mild and delicious beverage pairings with the Tim Tams, which is something that you decided you wanted to riff on. No. Yes, I did. And um, what is really cool about these cookies is you bite off the ends of them mm-hmm. and they are like a straw. So what you do is you suck up the hot liquid, whether it's coffee, tea, or whatever you like. And once once you suck the liquid up and you can feel it in your mouth, you slam the whole cookie in your mouth. And the whole that whole um, production is called the Tim Tam Slam. And the whole thing just sort of melts in your mouth, kind of like a chocolate bar. It's absolutely delicious. It's one of the great cookie pleasures one can go through. Yeah, and it's unlike anything I've ever tried before and um what you're talking about is the time i used uh clam juice (laughs) let me take a step back here you polled your readers to try to figure out what the worst possible food combinations could be so tim tams instead of hot milk or hot tea or hot water or whatever could be good with it your readers decided to suggest what clam juice delicious Uh clam (laughs) brine baby Oh my God. I'm getting nauseous just thinking about it. Did um, you, yeah. did you heat the, okay. Okay. I have so many questions, too many questions. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. This Tim Tam slam, I think requires a hot liquid. Yes. Which begs the question, did you drink hot clam juice with this thing? Yes. Oh because the whole thing, the whole, the whole thing is that Why? you have to, you, you have to have a hot liquid to melt the chocolate. <laughs> Otherwise you won't really get, 
the the wicking effect that the cop that the cookie has. I'm so upset. <laughs> it's just this sounds worse when you say it out loud, <laughs> maybe. Um, and the fact that they actually sell something like clam juice at almost all supermarkets is really messed up when you think about it. But I mean, you're going to make a seafood soup that's kind of like an invaluable ingredient. Is that just the water that clams spew out when they're being cooked? Is that what clam juice is? It's either that or they just boil clams and kind of get as much flavor out of them, I think, as possible. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Like, I I can't imagine they put a bunch of clams into a press. (laughs) (laughs) They just grind them up into a paste and then mix it with the water. I mean, it depends on the quality of clam juice, I guess. Well, I mean, when you think about prune juice, prune juice is pretty much like prune puree and water. Oh my god! So I mean, this this you know the thing about clam juice though is it's it's like clear. So I'm guessing it's not your clam puree and water. It's cloudy. So you heat this stuff up. You got a cup of it. You bite the two ends off the tim tam. You suck it up. At what point do you ask yourself why am I doing this with my life? Uh see when you start asking yourself that question, then you know you're on the right path. Yeah, well, yes, you're on the right path and you're going to make, the problem is you're going to make yourself stop. But the thing is, I want to know what it's like. Like, I want to know what the, what the most ridiculous, most mind-numbingly stupid thing you you can experience with food is like. And I, I did it. So how bad (laughs) was it? Um, so the thing is like clam juice by itself is already so mild. It sounds repulsive, but it's very mild. Like, you can't really taste it. It just sort of tastes... It's like umami vaguely. water or salty water. Lightly yeah, salted not, water. It's like not even salty. That's that's the oh. part that's kind of impressive about it. It's just sort of a little bit like shellfish, but like it's basically just a reason to charge you like four bucks for this small bottle. So it wasn't vomit inducing? No, not at all. It, just, it was sort of like drinking hot water through a cookie... So this is a publicity stunt, is what you're telling me. Well, I mean, I won't lie and say there wasn't some intention grabbing the ball. <laughs> I often get made fun of by my family members for a disgusting food combination. I inadvertently stumbled upon when I was a little kid. My grandparents, it was one of their last hurrahs before they left this earth. They took us on a family cruise, and it was an all-inclusive cruise. And so in the morning, there's a big spread, a buffet. Maybe it was lunch. I don't know. But I'm a little kid. And I go on the buffet and I'm like, hey, what are my favorite foods? They're shrimp. I'm going for the shrimp. And then when it came time to go to the beverage section, I thought, well, what's my favorite beverage? Chocolate milk. So I'm sitting at the table, mowing on shrimp with, I assume, cocktail sauce, drinking a chocolate milk. My cousin spots this and I've been made fun of ever since. I can't tell you what it tasted like. I was so young, but that was my disgusting combination. And it sounds like it was probably more gross than yours, which was just really hot water. Pretty much. And. You know, that's a really funny thing to bring up because um, my wife and I <laughs> had been thinking about starting a podcast. This was ages ago. We never did it, but we were going to call it Sushi and Milk <laughs> because we just thought that combination. I think shrimp and milk would be better, dude. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Cause, yeah. Milk's uh, weird. Jews don't drink milk. When I would go to my friend's houses as a kid who aren't Jews, and I just, their parents would give them a glass of milk for a dinner. I'm just like, what are you doing? But it's not, it's not forbidden, right? It's, it's like, not forbidden. It's just odd. The idea not, of drinking yeah. milk out of a glass to me, just very odd. Yeah. Now I, the dairy farmers are going to be after me. I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> well, you know, I, I have, I have not regularly done that since maybe eating a, a bowl of cereal in college, like as a really quick breakfast. And I don't even do that now. Yeah. Like I, have, I don't remember the last time I had like a bowl of cereal with milk in it. Well, we love milk. The dairy lobby is big. We do not want to mess with them. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm actually into big clam juice. So <laughs> <laughs> next time I have Cheerios. No, it's big hot dog. That's what's it's really big, coming after yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, hot dog, water, and cereal. Dennis, as always, thank you for being here. Thanks for going over your writings, going over your wonderful food combination. Where can folks find you on the internet if they were so inclined to look? If you're looking for me, you can find me at foodisstupid.substack.com. And you can also find me at my day job at The Takeout, uh, which is at thetakeout.com. And basically, if you just look wherever you want to read about food, I'm probably there. Thanks again.
Thank you. I'm David Cooper, and this is Going Well, I think, is the name of the show. And uh, coming up next is the tech stories of the day with our expert, Carmi Levy. So keep listening. I'll be back. And we're here with Carmi Levy. Have you ever wanted a brain implant that could let a computer do whatever the heck you wanted? I know that's a dream of mine. I'd probably just use it to annoy people. But tech expert Carmi Levy and I are going to talk about just that. Carmi! <laughs> Great to be back with you, David. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, what a pleasure. <laughs> Would you get a, a brain implant with a computer? I was, I've been watching a lot of sci-fi. It seems fun, but also terrifying. It seems it's of course it seems like fun. I think the terrifying thing is that these are wireless devices and we know that any wireless connectivity can be compromised in one way or another. So I'd want to know about security, of course. Yeah. How are you ensuring that the wrong person doesn't, you know, do a man in the middle kind of attack and take control of my brain when I'm not looking? Uh, but at the same time, if I had a reason to, like let's say I whatever, you know, what suffered a terrible accident and couldn't walk. There are all these medical conditions that we don't have therapies for right now. We don't have cures for them because medical science in its current state just can't figure it out. This brain control or brain computer interface, BCI, that could be the answer. If you could train your brain to do things that your arms, which no longer work, uh, you know, can no longer do, then would would you would you do it? I think if I were in a wheelchair and I didn't have any other choice, that would be a really cool option to explore. And, and you know, certainly now that we're seeing Neuralink move forward on human trials, I think it's super compelling for a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't have had hope. I completely agree, but I did just watch a show called the, A Murder at the End of the World, and you just talked about these devices being wireless. Somebody gets their pacemaker hacked in that show, Mm -hmm. And then the hacker, like, you know, ma makes the pacemaker malfunction and the person dies. So I do worry, like, the, if something's in my brain stem <laughs> and someone, like, sends an electrical jolt over it because they hacked it over the Wi-Fi, am I going to die? But that's the scary part. The <laughs> wonderful part is, that, yeah, it can help people who have mobility issues. Like, I'm thinking Stephen, Stephen Hawking. You know, in 30 years, if there was a Stephen Hawking scientist, this person could be completely, you know, with robotics and a brain implant, completely have a completely functional you know, body and, and deal with a lot of these disabilities. So that is kind of an exciting um, implication of it. But let's talk about this Neuralink implant, this 25-year-old named Nolan um, Arba, who yeah. is saying he can play video games now with the Neuralink. So he's a, he's a quadriplegic. Uh, he lost his mobility in a freak diving accident about eight years ago. So uh, can't move his arms, can't move his legs. Uh, and uh, and so he's he was implanted in January and bit by bit, Elon Musk has been sharing uh, stories uh, about him and he sort of released more details on him. Um, and he, as part of the testing, as part of the protocol to see if it actually worked, he is able to play chess. And he describes it almost like using the force uh, so that he can think where he wants something to go and then it goes there so the, yeah so after the implant they he's trained on how to play chess uh and uh and and he's able to play it for the first time since his accident and then he said even outside of the testing protocol when he went home he was able to train himself to play civilization six which is really his favorite game he likes chess he loves civilization six he played it a ton uh before his accident and so uh he played it so much at home that they had to uh recharge the battery on the remote control for his brain computer interface so, and so it's uh, it's be, it's serving the function as like a keyboard and mouse basically is that how it's yeah working? it's it's leapfrogging so you know they, they 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 train so he has thoughts and the thoughts are then interpreted to drive movement as if he were moving a mouse or a pointing device and clicking uh and then he's able to replicate that within the particular game so he trained up on chess now he can play chess just using his mind trained up on civilization civilization six now he can can play Civilization VI just using his mind. It's the most remarkable thing. It's it's almost like if we just kind of squeezed our eyes shut and imagined something happening, the BCI makes that possible for him. He doesn't need to move his hands. His brain is enough. 
Wow. This is like, a, I don't know, a scary dystopia or a wonderful future? Maybe a bit of both with all these. Yeah, I, I'm. you know me, I'm I'm ever the optimist. So I, I, I think the good outweighs the bad. Certainly there is the risk of, of uh, you know, on a cybersecurity level, certainly someone with malevolent intent could gain access to this technology uh, and take it over. And I think it's only a matter of time as these technologies become more mainstream that we will see more detail around the cybersecurity risks that that they impose, but I think the promise of them uh, it so far outweighs everything else. And like every technology, there will always be a concern, always some degree of risk. Uh, but we decide that the risk is acceptable given the benefits. That the benefits so far outweigh the dark side that we we go for it. And I think I think this you know this Nolan guy would agree. Uh, the risks are absolutely worth it because he's able to do things that he just couldn't do before. Um, and I think it's kind of opening it's opening people's eyes to the potential for this technology. Technology and Neuralink is continuing to to recruit for people to participate in these human trials. If I were in Nolan's shoes, I, I would see a case like this and go, maybe that could be me. Maybe I could have a miraculous outcome as well. So on the one hand, we have this miraculous technology that we maybe should fear, maybe be excited about. We should be worried about it. We should think, oh, wow, the future's here. But then we look at other electronics manufacturers and we see what they're doing and then think, hey, maybe things aren't that far along and things are going to be safe for a long time because I want to talk about Samsung. They put out this product called the S Pen, which is a fine product, I assume. It's a stylus, is it not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you buy a Galaxy S24 Ultra, which is their kind of flagship smartphone, it's this big screen device and it comes with a stylus that is stored in a, a slot inside the device. So you slide it in, it clicks in, and then when you want to make a note or jot something or navigate using the S Pen, uh, you just you pop it out of the out of the phone and you use it. And so it's for folks who remember back in the day using a Palm Pilot, remember the old uh, note devices from Samsung. Samsung, there are folks who swear by their styli. Uh, you know, use an Apple Pencil, it's the same thing. Um, but of course, like any technology, uh, they're finding that it does some weird things. Because it's stored inside the device, it gets warm uh, when you're using it, especially if you're playing a game or if you're doing something that's suit watching a video, watching a movie, something that's super compute intensive. Uh, and some users are reporting uh, on Reddit. And that, I love this. Uh, I love this. I love this. Please. <laughs> What are they that, reporting? That it smells like, well, some say it smells like burned plastic, which is understandable. And others say that it smells like, can I use the word poo? Wait, I just used You the can word poo, use so, the yes. word poo, but the word you can't use is that it <laughs> smells like sh <laughs> yes, can't use that word. Okay, <laughs> my wife's listening, so no. Um, but yeah, and and so interestingly enough, so this debate has been raging back and forth on Reddit. Someone who is a moderator on uh, the subreddit has on on the forum is has weighed in, and he says the the reason being is the device gets warm. This thing is made of plastic. Of course, the plastic will get warm and start to smell. We know that's a, a function of plastic, but uh, that it would smell this bad for this long, it doesn't go away. As the device gets older it's not like you know it smells a little bit because it's new and it's off gassing and then about a month later it's fine no this is a constant thing for the life of it and i remember back to when samsung galaxy note 6s were exploding because of their batteries because they were getting too warm and i'm wondering really do i want to have a device that warms my stylus up so much that it stinks like food <laughs> well i mean in terms, not. Of, in terms of exploding devices to smelly styluses <laughs> I, honestly the company's going in the right direction <laughs> yeah I, I guess so maybe it's a little bit better i'd rather have a have you know some stinkiness that i have to explain to my wife than you know like a raging fire in the middle of the kitchen uh, but i think this is you know the the fact that it's getting that warm uh, i think that's an engineering challenge for samsung and maybe they might want to rethink the design of not only the stylus but where it goes in the device in other words should it be a hole or a slot inside the phone or maybe there's a more elegant way to store it when you're not using it without subjecting it to this kind of heat uh, again th this is very much a first world problem but let's face it if i'm in a meeting the last thing i want is my phone stinking up the joint
Well, I'm remembering Apple's smear campaign from the 90s and 2000s where they would have that commercial where it's like, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC, and the PC was like a loser and the Mac was cool. Uh, basically, uh, Apple was just really poo-pooing Microsoft products, and I'm just imagining a smear campaign from Apple uh, towards Samsung being like, Samsung's phones, they stink, you know? <laughs> I see what you did there, poo-pooing, very well played. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of wonder if Justin Long, the actor who played uh, the character in that uh, those commercial series, I wonder what he's using. And I'm wondering what he would say if he were forced to use a Galaxy S24 Ultra. <laughs> I wonder if Let's he uses a Windows or a Mac computer at home. Yeah, is he Windows or Mac? <laughs> yeah, or you know, the, the the like, dude, you're getting a Dell guy. What does he use today? Oh yeah, like, all these years later, dude, like, dude, today? you're yeah. getting a Dell. <laughs> or or what was that song? Do it was like a remix of like a '90s dance song. Do you really want a clone? <laughs> you remember that one? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the fact that we're using the word clone and. 2024, it just seems so delightfully quaint. I miss those days. Yeah, I think if people started talking about clones in the tech sector now, they'd need literal human clones. That's right. Carmi, let's take a break and we'll come back and chat more about the tech stories of the day. Carmi, welcome back to the show. Oh, it is great to be back. I, I missed you over the commercial break. I know. There wasn't any commercials even. Just a little uh, cute jingle. Carmi, I want to talk sort of about the gold rush, which was back in the day when people were heading over to the West Coast to pan for gold. Then most recently, everyone was talking about the green rush. That's when there was just seemingly infinite money on any new cannabis-based businesses since it had become legal in Canada and the U.S. and various jurisdictions. I don't even know what to call this next rush. I want to call it like the cyborg rush. <laughs> it's <laughs> all these big tech companies rushing ever since Microsoft acquired, uh, what is it, OpenAI? Is that the name of the company? Yeah, yeah um, they've invested about $13 billion in them, I think. So. Um, ever since Microsoft did that and ever since ChatGPT was released, it seems like every big tech company is rushing to get a product out. Google, of course, uh, no, no, no exclusion, no exception. How does that idiom go? Google's yeah. doing it too. That's what yeah. I want to say. <laughs> Google is no exception. Yeah. And I don't know if you know this, Google, one of their more popular products. Um, I don't know if you've actually used it. Uh, the search is, um, <laughs> every once in a while. Yeah. You know, yeah. Vaguely. Whenever I meet people who work at Google, first of all, none of them ever work on the search. They're always like, I work on the maps. I work on Gmail. And then, um, I always make jokes like, oh, you work on the search. I don't think I've ever actually met someone who works at Google, and I used to live in Silicon Valley, who actually worked on the core search. It really makes you wonder, who's working on the search? I think they're just banned from talking about it because it is so integral to everything that Google does. If you look at how Maps is built or how Gmail is built, look at every Google product out there. Search is really the central pillar. It's what drives what makes it useful. So it's 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 the one pro it's the one sort of technology that is shared across Google's entire and landscape, it's, entire ecosystem. It's their secret sauce. Like if you yeah. attack the search as a competitor, like they don't have to be secretive about anything they could be open we do this share our code but if, they, if someone can come up with the next google like google's done you know that's right and because this was I, I often like to call it a generational technology it defined this generation google became the google that we know and love because search was such a game changer anyone who remembers navigating the internet before google came along it was almost impossible yeah you, you had Wait, to remember what are you, what are you, you talking about you're you're, you're <laughs> You're insulting my buddy Jeeves over here? <laughs> yeah, where is Jeeves now? He's gone. He's, he's been sunset. Is for Ask years. Jeeves? I want to see if Ask Jeeves is still up. I'm like looking right now. Askjeeves.com. It still, it still works. still there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but does he return anything worthwhile? It's just, you know, it, it, and I think it's safe to say that Google revolutionized search and has justly become the leading technology company of its time. Um, and, and that, you know, we have lived in the search era for the last 25 plus years because of it. Uh, and, but I think it's also safe to say that as AI becomes more of a thing, that it is 
it probably represents this new technology probably represents the biggest threat to the future of search uh, that Google has seen. And that's why when uh, when OpenAI released ChatGPT and it became as popular as it did, Google de declared a code red. Basically, whatever everyone's working on, stop. We're just going to pivot the company. Everything is all AI. And if you're not working on AI, well, then maybe you shouldn't be working here. It Google panicked mm -hmm. at that moment and has been panicking ever since trying to catch up because they recognize the existential threat that AI poses to search. So AI assisted search is their potential new product. I believe the product's called Search Generative Experience. Yeah, that SGE is going to become a really big thing. It's been available to beta testers for a while. You had to opt in. You'd have to you had to go to search labs, uh, and then you had to get yourself on a wait list, and then they would grant you access to it, which it basically is Google Search, but under the surface, it's powered by AI instead of the traditional search technology. Um, and it's to kind of meld the old and the new. Take Google's core search technology technology and AI ify it, put it in the hands of end users and then see what happens. D is it as trustworthy? Are the results as high quality as a traditional search? Um, is it subject to hallucination or going rogue or lying as we've seen with existing AI tools? Because that really is, is sort of the key. If we can't trust our search results, even if they're AI, that's a problem. So uh, you, know, you, you had this sort of limited audience of dedicated beta testers who have been using it for the past number of months now google is taking that search generative experience and they're opening it up to a wider audience you don't have to sign in anymore increasingly you might find it appearing in your regular google search experience whether you like it or not have you used this yet um, I played with it on a friend's test account because he's he's a developer. Uh, he signed up for it. The 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 searches that I ran uh, seem to be fairly straightforward. In other words, uh, I used the same prompts that I would have used for a traditional search, and I got back similar links and and well similar results that I would have expected from uh, a traditional search. The cool thing was it wasn't just links. As anyone who's ever used say Google Gemini uh, or ChatGPT knows full well. You don't just get a bunch of links and then you're on your own. You get a fully formed response. And that was the really cool thing about it. I thought, hey, if this can meld the trustworthiness of Google, which ChatGPT arguably doesn't have yet, no. with that sort of put it all together and do more of the work for me, take me beyond just a bunch of links, I thought this could really be something. But it's that trust factor that I still worry about. When I run a Google search, even though I'm only getting a bunch of links, I still trust that the majority of them are what I would expect. I still don't have that level of trust in this new SGE or search generative experience. And I'm guessing that's what this is all about. Google wants to put it in more and more hands to help build that knowledge base and build that level of trust in the technology so that they can shift over to it when the time is right. I find that ChatGPT just makes stuff up sometimes. There was this example <laughs> yeah. of a lawyer who was like, cite relevant cases to this topic. And then ChatGPT was like, oh, this is like Bob and Bob, the, you know, Margaret and Margaret. Like this case set the precedence in 1922. So he submitted this to the court or something like that. And then when they actually checked the cases, the cases didn't exist. And yeah. it just sort of like made up a case that matched what it thought. Like it doesn't. It makes stuff up that looks true. And I know maybe this example is too complicated for non-technical people, but sometimes you'll say, hey, hey, how do I solve this with computer code? And it'll spit out some computer code that looks right, but it'll like make stuff up. It'll, ref yeah. it'll reference like a command in the programming language that doesn't exist, you know? And so the code looks like it'll run, but then when the computer actually runs it, it's like, hey, this, this stuff that you were giving me doesn't exist. Yeah, they call it going rogue or hallucinating where, you know, it'll it'll generate something that doesn't exist or it, it might exist, but it's in the wrong context. It's the wrong kind of answer. And we've been saying all along, especially since ChatGPT was first released and kind of moved this entire genre into the mainstream, was uh, don't just take what it spits back at face value. Uh, ref, you know, review what you're seeing and then make sure that it's legit. Do your own due diligence, uh, which is all well and good for this early stage of AI. AI, but anyone who's used search knows full well that, you know, how, how much due diligence are you expected to do? At some point, you have to put your trust in the tool. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and if 
Google search powered by AI is not as trustworthy as Google search has been for the last 25 years. Maybe I don't want to use it. And for the future of Google, they'd better hope that they figure out this trust thing. They better hope that it stops lying, that it, it doesn't go rogue, that it doesn't cite things that didn't exist, that it's better trained uh, because otherwise we but, are going to have a major problem and Google's business will be at risk. But that's an interesting thing. You say one way to get it to tell the truth or not lie or go rogue is to be trained better. But if it's training on the set of human knowledge and the set of human written documents, humans are untrustworthy. <laughs> right. We lie. You know what I mean? Like if, if, if Google's training its search AI on all the documents that exist on the Internet, all the blog posts, all the Facebook posts, all the news articles on all the news websites, could be Fox, mm -hmm. could be CNN, could be some alt-right conspiracy wackadoodle website. If... Google is training itself on that. It's not going to have a reliable data set because it's, yeah. it's basing its trust, trustworthiness on the benchmark of people which aren't trustworthy. It's kind of worrisome. It kind of is, but I, I also see it as a bit of an opportunity. It's kind of like where we were at, where we were at in the early days of the internet. No one knew how these challenges or problems were going to be figured out and but we knew that there were some really smart people working at some really cool companies in silicon valley that were working on it and google cracked the search problem which for a long time no one could not to that degree uh and then of course here we are and i think that's where we're at with ai we're on sort of the we're on the you know this side of the mountain looking up we haven't climbed it yet we don't know what kind of challenges we're going to run into but we know it's going to be a really hard climb and hopefully someone is going to crack that hopefully we will figure out this ai challenge challenge and that AI will become more tr more trustworthy and will be less likely to go off the rails and say things that make absolutely no sense or, you know, get us disbarred, as is the case with this lawyer. Yeah. And I'm actually thinking there's a counter to my fear mongering saying Google's training itself on human written documents, which mm -hmm. contain lies. Google could also write AI to detect BS. It could write, you know, code yeah. to, to, okay, I'm reading this blog, I'm consuming it, I'm, I'm using it to train myself, but my BS detector is high because this blog seems a little bit off. It could do stuff like that. It absolutely could. We're very much at the beginning of the AI problem. And one of these companies, possibly Google, is at some point going to crack it and make it more trustworthy. So I think the opportunity is there, but the industry is just starting to chew that. And we are seeing initiatives to train better, to focus on more valid data sets, to not just, you know, take a Hoover vacuum cleaner and, and point it at the entire internet, internet, but choose our data sets much more carefully so that what's going in is of higher quality, which means what's coming out is of much higher quality as well. All right, so in the future, I'll be able to trust ChatGPT more. Carmi, thank you for being on the show. It's always a pleasure talking to you. So wonderful being with you. Thanks for having me, David. Mwah! All right, you know him. You know him. It's Tony Five coming, and he's got a bunch of games prepared. And by a bunch, I think just one or two terrible games for, well, it's the afternoon. So games afternoon, not games night. Tony Five in a moment. We are here with Tony Five from London, England, and we are going to play a good old-fashioned game. And by old-fashioned, I mean our forefathers and forefathers before them played this game while they were sailing across the Pacific Ocean to who knows where. Tony, welcome to the show. Hello, David Ninian. That, that forefather night was a great night for uh, all mothers out there. I'm I actually guess. Jewish, so when I was five days old, they removed my forefather, but that's a conversation for another show. That's uh, a different one. I wanted to do a game, David. Now, the game I wanted to do was Rockstar or Racist. Couldn't find it, so I've gone for Rockstar, Rock Band, or Pornstar. I love it. So the game's simple. Tony and I are going to trade off, give a name of something, and the one who is guessing will have to guess whether that thing is a porn star, a rock band, or a racehorse. This game is actually kind of difficult, and I'm excited to jump in. Tony, why don't you start by asking me one? David, uh, this is one that I've uh, quite often um, thought of many a night. Akuma. Akuma? Yeah. It sounds Not like... Not Makata, just Akuma. I was going to say, it sounds like a character from The Lion King. Uh, and yeah. The Lion King has animals in it, and so I'm going racehorse because I have no idea. Rock band, baby. Oh. Rock band. Why'd you say correct? Oh, because The Lion King has animals in it? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, I'm a genius. <laughs> you, you are a genius, David. You're wasted on a radio show that no one listens to. All right. Carry on. All right. Zephyr. Is it we're at the post and Zephyr's off? Is it dun 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 Zephyr? Or is it Zephyr? Oh, my. You see what I did? I had to use Zephyr in all three contexts. 
Yeah, I don't know what the last one was, but sounds good. So Zephyr the Porn Star, Zephyr the Racehorse, or Zephyr the Rock Band? It's definitely Rock Band. I'm, uh, I'm you're correct on that. That is Thank you. Tony One, David Zero. Uh, Gerda. <laughs> kind of sounds like Gertha. Cheese. But just Gerda oh, with, a hard G, with a hard G. Gerda. She sounds like a very niche German porn star that caters in leather. Type you things. are correct that she's a porn star or he's a porn star. I really don't have any more details. We probably should have looked up the things that these are. Well, you know, David, uh, women can be porn stars too. I know. Look at this, 2024. Yeah. It's an equal opportunity uh, form of employment. Uh, right. My one, David. Are you ready for this? Yeah. This was my former Tinder name, but don't let that sway you. Big Brown. Maybe a horse, actually. Really? Yeah. Ah, you're right. Because I was hoping for like a big Gandhi type well, looking no, dude. No, because horses are brown and they can be big. And sometimes, you know, while naming a racehorse, they try to get away with the maximum amount of inappropriateness. So there it Correct. is, big brown. So they try and get the innuendo at that critical mass, that critical balance of innuendo that they can't get fired over. But actually, people will associate it with something ridiculous, right? Like C, sexual biscuit. All right, this next one is, I don't know if this one's hard in a way. Baby J, Baby J, rock band racehorse or porn star? See, could be any of them. That's such a good one. Baby J, I, I don't think it's a horse. It sounds slightly pedophilic for a porn star. I'm going to go rock band. Oh, you got it right again. Oh my, I'm really good at this. It's, oh, it's I'm, I'm really good at this. Okay. Are you ready for this? Okay. Vo Rogue. Vo Rogue. Vo, first name, Rogue, certain name. Maybe like a really pretentious intellectual art rock band kind of thing. Weirdly, a racehorse. <laughs> All right, you've got three right, I've got one right. Della Grace, porn star, rock band, or racehorse? Porn star, 100%. You know this one well? You have a poster of her on your wall? <laughs> I, I'll be honest with you. I answered that way too quickly for my own good. I'm so, actually looking this porn star up. It appears to be maybe a man. Right. Fair enough. Uh, very good. No, 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 no. It's a woman. And I shouldn't have looked that up. And there she is. She's definitely uh, a porn star. And I'm definitely yeah, delete looking. your history, David, before Miranda comes in. Right. What about extra heat? And let me give you the context. Extra spelt with an X. Oh, rock band. Maybe like a metal band. Racehorse, David. Whoa, I'm not good I at this game. I led you into that one. I led you into that one. Yeah, Rick. Yeah, fantastic. Right, last one from me, which is a very good one, Nijinsky. Uh, but imagine it with a rolling R, a rolling Nijinsky. Don't I ask you like them Russian. and then you ask me them? You just went twice in a row. So did you, David, before that. Did and I? I didn't want to sort Yeah, you did. You went straight in. <laughs> Most of the listener will probably know that. And I just wanted to get my own back. All right, let's hear it. Nijinsky. Nijinsky. Porn N star. Nijinsky. Porn star. Racehorse. And a very famous racehorse in England, actually. Really? Which is why I said it. You would never have heard of it. But yeah, very famous. And a massive dong. What are the big ones in the US? Seabiscuit and Secretariat? Those are the only two that I know. And Malcolm Luther King? No, that's not a racehorse. Uh, all right. Well, this was uh, one game. Do you want to play another, maybe? Have you got any more? No. We can play tennis. All right. I don't know how well, I mean, how many physical games could you play on the phone? That's pretty good, yeah. Thank you, that's the ball. Ush, ush, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> where are you playing oh, tennis? Uh, do you know what? I haven't been allowed on a call for ages, to be fair. Yeah, I know why. Security escorts you out. <laughs> Absolutely. It's part of your probation. You're not allowed to go 100 feet of a tennis court. Probation that I'm not allowed to play tennis. At, oh, yeah. No, I, I quite like that game, actually. If anybody's listening and wants to play that game with me, please call the show on 056-744-21183. Seven. Definitely the number for this. Four. All right, we're here with Tony, and game number two is one of his favorites. One of mine, I don't know. One of it's like dystopian hell. This game, carry off key. Do you want to say how the game's played, Tony? Because it's just <laughs> so you've all heard of karaoke. This is more carry no key. One of my favorite games, backed by possibly no demand. David can't stand it. I find it brilliant. Whenever we do it, where I do it from my studio, which in other words is my mum's basement, it really annoys all the neighbours. Um, I really love doing it. So what I will do is I will uh, 
sing a song, a popular music song in the style of a jazz or club singer, abstract, and David needs to guess it. So uh, It's like name yeah. that tune, but you're out of tune. Out of tune, name that tune. Uh, that's a great new name for it. Name that karaoke. out of tune, carry off yeah. key with Tony. Exactly. Yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll give you, uh, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the correct song afterwards, but let, let's go for it here. Are you ready, David? I'm so ready. Uh, we, yellow Submarine, Yellow Submarine. David, Yellow Submarine by the Beatles, and I'll play you the original version. <laughs> I don't think we have the licenses to play that original version as sung by the original virgin. <laughs> The original version as sung by the Beatles. <laughs> Correct. All right, David. Oh one, one other one. Uh, a very popular song. Um, I will. You've got a slight advantage over it because uh, they're from your uh, your your island country. Are you ready for this? Oh yes. Celine Dion. You've done this one before. Yeah, but I've done it in a different style. If you notice, David, I did the a cappella version. True. True. Yeah, I'm yeah. Blind, so Jack. for those who don't know the song, I'll sing the original. Okay, so uh, I think what we'll do is uh, we'll we'll do the last one now. Now, now, David, this is a very good one. I'm doing it in memory of the person who's no longer with us. Are you ready for it? So ready. Are you ready? I'm so ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's uh, I want to feel the heat with somebody. David. Uh, Whitney Houston is somebody to love. That's a banger, that song. He's a winner. You know what song I can't get out of my head? Okay, we'll talk. let's talk about Whitney Houston, and then we'll talk about that. That was the first uh, song that I ever danced to a girl with, and I kissed her on the cheek with. You oh, know that? I want to kiss I with dance. somebody. Look at that. Yeah. You know what yeah. song is maybe related, but also not? Gloria. Oh. I, for, I don't even know who that's by. <gasps> Gloria. 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 Who sang for a breakdown? Gloria. Who is that? Who sings that? That's uh, a fantastic song. Yeah. That is song. I do like that. That's a, that's, a, and it, that, that's a running song, you know. A lot of people can like sort of jog to it, run to it, work to it. Brannigan. Like Laura, Laura Brannigan. Oh, but then, see, of those era songs, I, it's like the flash dance songs as well. Tony, like I think I, you're having a stroke. We better get out of here. Tony, thank you as always for playing games with me on this uh, terrible show. It's always good. What is the emergency number in the US? Uh, I think it's 7432718. It's 911, Tony. You didn't know that? What is in the UK? I it's it like 223 or, or something. Isn't it like, no, ours is 999. 999. Yeah, so you just hit the number. You're dying. You just hit the number. With your one, you've got to go nine and then go all the way up diagonal to one. one. I know. It's people ridiculous. are just dying in the streets. They need an ambulance, <laughs> but they can't move their finger from nine to one, and they just bleed out. And that happens in you the U.S. and Canada see, all the time. You'll be laughing all the way to the ER when you can't press 911, and you call AAA to come and help you. Quick, what's the number to 911? <laughs> <laughs> Tony, thank you for being here. David, love you. Okay, all right, okay. You know how it all works. I'll play a jingle, and then I'll bring my next guest, who is therapist Gary Dierenfeld. He's a social worker, and he joins me today for Therapy Thursdays on a Tuesday, and he'll answer the question that you want answered. That question, of course, when is an affair an affair? Okay, maybe you didn't want that answered, but I'm sure we'll have an interesting discussion because he has a lot of thoughts on the matter. When is an affair an affair with Gary Dierenfeld in just a moment? <music> Gary Deerenfeld, thank you for being here as always. <laughs> you always make me laugh when you introduce me. You know, uh, uh, great to be with you, David. I just love chatting with you. Me too. Is it because when we chat privately at the break, I'm like, oh, hey, and then I, I start recording and I'm like, <laughs> and we're back with Gary. De is it just the massive, what is it, a code switch? It's that Mr. Radio personality <laughs> bleeding through. Uh, there you have it. I am excited to hit our topic today because i have long been someone who views affairs as mm -hmm. kind of being on a spectrum 
You know, just like wicked deeds are on a spectrum. I could shoplift a candy bar and I could commit, you know, a war crime. And both okay. are illegal. Both are criminal acts. But one, it's like, okay, you stole a candy bar. Maybe don't do that again. <laughs> the other is like, you should be in jail for the rest of your life. I kind of use view affairs that way. And when I try to explain this to people, if an affair has either traumatized them or, tra or they grew up with infidelity in their family and their parents split up, I often get in these arguments and I, I don't really know what to say. And so I guess the wider question is, what is an affair? When is an affair an affair? And let's talk everything to do with affairs. I just said that word 45 times. <laughs> you know, this subject and how we're going to talk about it, it reminds me of a Seinfeld episode. They're talking with Elaine and I think Kramer and Seinfeld. And they're, the question is, when is it sex? And I, th I think it was Seinfeld. Jerry says, says, if there's a nipple involved. When the nipple comes out, that's <laughs> it. It's sex. Whatever else happens doesn't matter. If the nipple comes out, it's sex. So <clears throat> you, you apply that thinking to when is an affair an affair? Well, for me, the answer is when there's a breach of trust. Agreed. Agreed. That's, that's the point. Then we can, we can certainly see how many angels can dance on the head of a pin you know, saying how, how great that breach of trust is. But if you're on the receiving end, is any breach of trust acceptable or good? Well, I think there's people that have unreasonable expectations around quote unquote trust. I was interviewing someone a very long time ago and I clearly do not agree with his thinking, but he's like, men can't be friends with women if they have a girlfriend. Because if they oh, have what? a friend, but I'm uh, like, okay, does that mean you know, your girlfriend's not allowed to have male friends. And if she just has a male friend and she hangs out with them, that's cheating. I don't know. There, there can be First people all, with that, war. That is such a horrendous myth. Agreed. I have so many women friends who truly are friends. There's never been anything sexual. There's not going to be anything sexual. And Mitt Romney's got binders full of them. Wow, that was a really deep cut. That's like, what, 20, 2008 election? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's this breach of trust. And of course, depending on the individual and what their own history is, that breach of trust can feel more or less significant. So if you yourself come from a family where your parents, uh, where the, the marriage has been impacted upon, your parents' marriage been impacted upon by an affair, you may have a different set point if you will mm -hmm. for what's acceptable or not acceptable so so you know this question of when is an affair an affair is in part influenced by our own experience but the other part is who who breached the trust how are they taking responsibility and are they in a sense gaslighting because you know sometimes people say that wasn't a, an affair. Yeah. Like the nipple didn't come out. Yeah. Or we, you know, I didn't text you and I stayed <laughs> over at my female friend's house, you know, and I was flirting with her all day and somebody told you I was flirting with her all day, but you're crazy for thinking anything happened. Something like that. Yeah. So, you know, I get emails, texts, messages, you know, about one partner finding messages on their partner's phone. Mm. And some of those messages are salacious. Some of them Whoa. are trending towards a meeting. Whoa. So, so no, no, so no, Gary, going what? through your partner's phone without their permission <clears throat> is Look, an extreme I, breach of trust. And it's kind of like when the police act inappropriately, maybe they search your house without a warrant and they find oh, evidence of a crime. Listen, David, no problem with what you're saying. No problem. That, that to some degree, yes, that too is a breach of trust, but let's, let's just say it's with cause. My partner is doing something that is uh, creating suspicion concern for me, and it's not uncommon for people to look through people's phones. It's not, let, but I think it's let, wrong, and I think if you're willing to do it, you should end things. Like I think it's that much of a breach of trust that if you need to spy on your, like setting up a webcam or setting up a hidden microphone or okay, going. But again, you're going into different degrees of mistrust, 
And he, here's where I'm going to meet you on this. If your mistrust is so great of your partner that you actually do have to surveil them, there's already a problem. And the problem may be you or the problem may be them, but there's right. a problem. <clears throat> that, no issue. Let's, let's go back Fine. to the top. I just, uh, two of, wrongs don't make a right on that one. And that one always, when I hear about people <clears throat> going through others' phones and then finding things they when, don't like, I'm I, like, I you're both history. guilty. My, my wife says to me today, oh, I, I need to look something up. She didn't have her phone. Can she have mine? And of course she can have mine. She's got all of my passwords. She can do sure. anything she sure. wants with any of my um, uh, devices. I've got nothing to hide. Um, sometimes you got to wonder if you can't have access to your partner's sure. device. And now all that aside, for whatever reasons you do gain access and you see something that says this is a slippery slope okay and it can be uh look at it could be sexting there could be sexual images and pictures going back and forth it could be hey you know it was great getting together with you for dinner the nipple didn't come out but they went for dinner and that wasn't shared with the partner so there are different degrees to this. I think that's where I was going with this. But how that is handled by the partner also speaks volumes about their own sense, their own sense of guilt for their own behavior. That's, I think that's where I was going. Fair enough. All right, now I'll <laughs> drop the phone thing. I just, whenever I hear that, I get set off. Um, you know, if you're living with someone who's forever gaslighting you, and you don't know truth from fiction. Sadly, sometimes the only way to, to know what the heck is going on is to surveil, is to record, is to go through the, and I'm not sitting here promoting this, David. I'm, not I'm just explaining uh, these are scenarios that people go through when they feel like they're going crazy trying to differentiate fact from fiction. And if already, if you're in that kind of relationship, I don't even think you need to find evidence to say there's something wrong with this relationship. That's what I'm saying. If you feel the need to surveil to that level, um, and I honestly think going through people's text messages and emails is as bad as setting up a hidden camera. That's just my opinion. I'm not sure you agree with it or have to agree with it. But if you're willing to do that, what I'm saying is there's a problem. Whether yeah. it's you, you have trust issues, you don't respect boundaries, or it's your partner, they're a piece of you know what, and you just don't know whether you're being gaslit and you want evidence of it. Regardless of whether you're sort of justified or not, there is a problem when you get to that point. And I know we're kind of getting off topic here, but I feel like this one's important. And I hear people go through others' devices all the time now, willy nilly, and they act like they're not invading the partner's trust and, and crossing boundaries, and they are. That's all I'm trying to say, Gary. Got it. Here's the issue, though we can stick superficially with you did this, I did that. The real issue is what's underneath all of this? What is going wrong in our relationship? What are we bringing to each other that is creating the conditions that? you feel you either need to spy on me or I am doing something that is undermining your trust in me. And, and so do we have difficulties communicating? Do we have difficulties resolving conflict? Um, uh, uh, has, has some spark left this relationship? Are there other issues that haven't been talked about? Are there personality variables? Are there mental health issues? Because sometimes we so stick to the superficial who did what or didn't that we don't address, but what really gave rise to the problem. And when we do address that, we put people like you in business. <laughs> All right, we're, the, we're here with Gary Dierenfeld. When we come back, we're going to talk more about when an affair is an affair. We are back with Gary Deerenfeld. Gary, always a pleasure having you here with me. Thanks, David. Do you mean that? Probably. Uh, we're talking. <laughs> you know, I love you, right? I know. I love this you isn't too. our first rodeo. I, I love being on with you. What are you talking about? We're Jews. You've never been to a rodeo, and neither have I. 
That's true. I actually have been once, and I did not fit in. <laughs> I stuck out. It was in ba- near Bakersfield, and that's a story for another day. Um, we were talking about when affairs are affairs, and if you suspect an affair, you might surveil your partner. This happens with a lot of people. We were talking about spying on people via their phones, via electronic devices, and I was sort of condemning those who go through their partner's text messages as wrong under all circumstances. But what Gary was trying to say and what you should say in the scenario like that is what's really going on. And that's what puts social workers and that's what puts therapists in business. (laughs) That's my bread and butter. And that's okay because at the end of the day, look, uh, I'm here to help people resolve their issues. Uh, so yeah, they do pay me for that. That's the business. And hopefully I help them through that as quickly as possible. Uh, but getting back to, to the real meat and potatoes of the argument or, or the discussion, um, if you feel you need to sur- surveil your partner, like already something's off. I, and, and, and I get it because again, some people are slippery. Some people are excellent gaslighters so that you may never know what the heck that person is doing unless you you take a look behind you know the curtain so to speak i i i would like if people could also try uh being open and transparent and say you know i'm feeling insecure about our relationship i don't know why i feel somewhat disconnected and in that disconnection, it's causing me to worry that you may be thinking about other people or even may be wandering towards other people. You don't need to acknowledge that or not, up to you. I would like us to work on the relationship. How can we do that? That is such an authentic, transparent approach that that even if it's met with gaslighting, I think you can be proud of yourself. Yeah, I think that like therapy 101 is you can control your own behavior. You can, you yes. can behave in ways that you feel um, proud of, that you feel represented how you're feeling well, maturely. I often worry for people, in a sense, what I call contaminating the field by engaging in behavior that can be used against them. And so that surveillance, that sneaking through the phone, even though I'm not going to condemn it, because I I get where it's coming from, and sometimes the felt necessity for it, the flip side is that can be the focus of the other person's attention and used in their gaslighting of the situation. So the degree to which your behavior is, in a sense, beyond reproach, you stand a better chance of holding the other person accountable. Look, it's not perfect. I'm not saying that this is perfect. I'm just cautioning people about their engaging in behavior that may reflect poorly on them as they're trying to resolve issues. I agree completely. I agree. And back to what I, what I was saying, like you can only conduct yourself with integrity. You can't, if someone's shifty, if someone's shady, you can't force them to. But at the end of the day, if you act well, if you communicate what your boundaries are, you can feel good about that. Um, yeah. And for the most part, for the most part, persons who have these concerns of their partner, trust concerns, for the most part, people can trust their, in a sense, feelings, intuitions on this. There are some persons who totally get it wrong, where it is a projection of their own insecurity. So, you know, before you go over this with your partner, maybe you do want to speak with a therapist yourself to say, look, I'm having these problems. This is my background. Do you think it could be just me? Do you think it could be them? And let's face it, sometimes it's it's actually both as well. So so rather than going down the rabbit hole with your partner, you may want to get a little bit of work done on yourself first to to hopefully best manage 
you're raising and dealing with your concerns. I agree. I agree. I want to get back to the original topic. Sure. When an this, when, and it's related, what I'm trying mm. to say here. When, when is an affair an affair? And I think that, and if you suspect your partner's having an affair, that's how we got down this rabbit hole. Yes, yes. Um, how do you even define what an affair is? And it's kind of a trick question because in my opinion, it's different for everybody. And, it, you know, I could have dinner with a female friend and come home late and not have told my girlfriend and she trusts me and there's nothing weird going on there and she knows I have friends who are women. Um, and that would be fine. For other couples, if you were to have dinner with a female coworker, if you were a man, that would be a problem. For me, that wouldn't work. I wouldn't want to be in a relationship like that. But there are those that are on the same page about these things. And while boundaries and what the definition of affairs are, heck, Gary, there's people in open relationships. There's people with, who are swingers who get intimate with other partners and they don't consider that an affair. And so I think what's important is you just have to be on the same page. And I, 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 I agree. So the flip side is you have to define what an affair is for you. Um, is it when the nipple comes? I love the Seinfeld routine. <laughs> is it when the nipple comes out? Is it when there's been um, any sexual exposure or contact of any kind? Is it when we are lusting for one another? Is it when we are setting up to meet it? Like where where do you define that breach of trust for you and to what degree do you want to use that as a jumping off point to resolve relationship issues or to castigate the other and act out your own anger animosity and upset these wind up being very personal decisions and people will draw their own lines in the sand and wherever, from my perspective, wherever you draw your line is fine by me. Yeah. Because this is your life. As long as you're not hurting anyone. And I think sometimes there's lines that are like sexist or weird and, but in general. Um, right. I, I agree with that. What do you do when you're not on the same page as a partner? They, they conduct themselves or, or act in a certain way that you consider to be having an affair. Maybe they're too close with a coworker. You know, the old... Uh, stereotype of a work wife or a work husband. What if your partner thinks that kind of behavior is okay and you don't? How do you reconcile you consider certain behavior to be having? Well, sometimes you don't recon reconcile these differences, David. That's why we've got the phrase irreconcilable uh, differences. <laughs> right? You sound like my you, divorce you, lawyer, but go on. You, there you go. We don't necessarily reconcile them. Then you have to choose what you can and can't live with within the terms of the relationship. And that's where some will continue and some will discontinue. Um, hopefully we, if it's to discontinue, it's in a way that leaves both persons otherwise intact and not having to run to um, the most egregious of divorce attorneys. But they can say, you know, this hurts. However, this isn't what I want in my life. This doesn't work for me. I, but I think before pulling the plug, people have to be very clear as to what that boundary is. And then the discussion then becomes, now that you know where that boundary is for me, can you abide by that within, within our relationship or not? Man, these are difficult and very mature conversations to have. Um, ego aside hurt aside anger aside and um it it takes a lot of work to have that degree of mature conversation gary are you gonna think i'm having an affair when i have another guest on later in the show i thought it was just me i thought it was just you and me, <laughs> i've got David. different boundaries than you gary <laughs> it's always a pleasure having you here i really appreciate your time this was fun despite a serious subject matter it was fun thanks well you liked it because i talked about nipples <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not, not wrong. <laughs> All right, that's a wrap on the show. If you didn't like it, you can return it for what you paid. I'm David Cooper, and I'll be back tomorrow with more This Is Going Well, I think.